Hey, do you feel every day less and less at home in this world? There's a lot of reasons for that, but if you know Jesus, that's a really good thing. Hey, we're not long for this world. It won't be very long before we're going to see Jesus. He's coming soon. I'm going to talk about that for a few minutes, and we're going to find it in Psalm 120. I'm Pastor Kerry. Welcome back to Growing in the Gospel the YouTube channel that's de- that's focused on encouraging you and your spiritual growth with the Word of God. You can find a lot of things on the channel, and I hope you'll go to actually the Growing in the Gospel YouTube channel and click on the playlists and explore the study that we're doing in the Gospel of John, explore the one-year Bible journey. We're going through the whole Bible, explore the Clash of Kingdoms, the Book of Revelation. And today we're going to finish up our slow walk through Psalm 120. So the last two days, this is our third video in Psalm 120, we've been talking about this section of 15 psalms called a song, Songs of Degrees or song, Psalms of Ascent. 15 psalms that were designed for the pilgrimage for Hebrew worshipers to sing on their way up through the rocky twists and turns and the canyon-like road that goes out of the desert up into Jerusalem. It would have been a long, arduous uphill journey. Long, but not long. I mean, it would have been one day from out of the hills all the way up to Jerusalem. Tiring, hard. It's a sojourn. It's a pilgrimage going up to the city of God. And the people that were going to Jerusalem were going to worship and to celebrate and to feast and have these festive seasons with their friends and family members and people from all over the country. It was like a national family reunion at God's house. (laughs) It was so, so fun and so enjoyable. And yet the journey there was a pilgrimage. And these were the songs that were designed to help them endure and understand the pilgrimage and prepare for the journey and for the destination. And wouldn't you know it, the first theme of the songs, the 15 songs of the pilgrimage is distress. We talked about that the last two days. Look at it with me, Psalm 120 and verse 1, and hold on, because today I think it's pretty special what we're going to talk about and what we're going to see in this passage. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. So a follower of God should expect distress, should understand the nature of distress, and should let that distress compel them to run to the Lord and pray and cry out and look up. And guess what you find when you take whatever distress there is in your life, whether it's self-created, whether it's imposed on you by external forces, whether it's a mess you made, a regret you have, whatever the distress you feel, you can bring it to God and guess what he's going to do? He's going to hear you. Verse one, he heard me. We belong, if you know Jesus, we belong to a God who has a gentle heart and a shepherdly soul and a fatherly spirit. He is a caregiver. He is at heart a nurturer. And he wants to walk with you through this life. We always want to know so much more about tomorrow and the next day. We want to know the whole path. We want to know the whole plan. I do too. I want to know the whole script. And God just says, look, you worry too much about it. Just give me your distress. Trust me. Enjoy the journey. It's like being two again. Just buckle up in your car seat, get in the back seat, let God drive. He knows where he's going. He knows where to take you. He knows how to get you home. I'm telling you, so many times in my life, I've tried to control, I've tried to get up into the driver's seat, grab the wheel, and steer this thing called life, and I always drive into a ditch. But the best times in life are when I just get in my car seat and buckle up and enjoy the journey. Sing the songs. <laughs> tell the jokes. Enjoy the journey. Laugh. Tell stories. Share stories. God is taking you and me on a pilgrimage. And he doesn't want us to be in distress. He wants to calm our fears, resolve our anxieties. He wants to provide for our needs and pay our bills. And he wants to forgive our sins. And and just little by little, he wants to walk us forward one day at a time with grace that is sufficient for whatever comes at us that day. And I'm reminded every day that he has a plan for today's problems, challenges, challenges. And he's going to get me through them. I don't have to worry too much about tomorrow's. Now, there's a difference between worrying about tomorrow's anxieties and fears and unanswered questions, having control of tomorrow, which we can never have, 
versus um, making appropriate biblical plans. If the Lord will, then this is how I want to follow. That's completely appropriate. But not the fear, not the worry. God wants to walk me on this journey as a loving father. And for some that have never had a loving father, well, his arms are open, his heart is ready. And if you've never trusted him, I hope you'll trust Jesus today and let the Father God bring you into his family and sit you at his table and put you at rest. We all need a Lord that we can cry to, who will listen to us, who actually has the power to do something, okay? And who's not going to send us a bill after we're done. Verse two, the cry, the cry is, deliver me, Lord, deliver my soul. We talked about yesterday how that's a, in the first position, it's a salvation cry. Deliver my soul from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue, including mine. Deliver me from my own sins. Forgive me of my own sins. But then the second sense of this is, Lord, I live in a land of lies. I live in a land of deception. And that has never been more true than it is right now. I mean, and God said that in the, in the last days, perilous times would come. He said that deception would grow. Satan is the father of lies. He's a murderer from the beginning. He is the great deceiver. His systems at the end of time will become increasingly more and more deceptive. And I was uh, talking with somebody in my office just a little while ago, and they were uh, twice today. We were just talking about how the world has lost its collective mind. We can't even define a woman anymore. We, we, we have no idea what marriage is. We, we are throwing life away. We're throwing freedoms and liberties away in our country, and we're we're, we're, we, we, I, I would have never imagined in my lifetime I would ever say these words. My country is falling again, pray to the lie of anti-Semitism. There are places in this country where Jewish people are being oppressed and abused. That is just shockingly appalling to me. So yeah, we live in a world that's collectively losing its mind. It's losing its grasp on reality and on truth and on anything of value and anything honorable. And and we live in a world that's calling horrific evils, acceptable, good, noble, honorable, like the taking of a life of an unborn child, a right. We live in a world that can no longer define marriage or sexuality or gender. I mean, it's just a perverted mess of entangled lies and deception. And so the prayer is, Lord, deliver me from this. And in the short term, it's God, give me the discernment to see through it, to see past it, to live, to live beyond it, to live in spite of it, despite it, uh, to live honorably and not fall into it. God, deliver me. Don't let me fall prey to the lies and to the deceit. Don't let me uh, fire back. Don't let me get drawn into lying or deception. And then a cry for justice. I love this, verse 3. In distress, put justice in God's hands. And that's what the prayer is. And again, this is the song of the pilgrims going to Jerusalem. And so the first song that these parents are teaching their kids as they're journeying and singing on the way to God, on the way to their city, their home, their homeland, is they're saying, you know, life is, is following God to the city of God. Our journey home is going to have some distress. But we have a God who hears us. We have a God who saves us. We have a God who will deliver us from the massive deception and delusion that's around us. And we have a God who can bring about justice against those deceptions. Verse 3, what shall be given unto thee or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? I get the idea here that this was an injustice being, being put on the singer, that the singer is a victim of this injustice and is crying out for justice. What should be done to the lies? But I think of this in a bigger sense. Um, what will be done to the ultimately to the enemies of God, to the lies and deception, the system, the systemic deception that's going on all around us. Verse four, sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Juniper is a kind of tree and uh, the root system of that tree was used to create a kind of coal that was very hot burning and long burning. And sharp arrows of the mighty is an idea that the straightest, sharpest arrowheads from the strongest military 
basically the weapons of the liars, the weapons of the deceivers are going to be turned back and used against them. So verse three and and verse four is a prayer. It's, it's a, it's embedded in the prayer, but it's looking out at the lies and at the liars and deceivers and evil enemies of God and enemies of the singer, the worshiper, the follower of God. I'm reminded of our Revelation series of how much war in the last days is going to be made against Christians and against people people that follow Jesus, people of God, and against the Jewish people. So you can fully expect in these last days that even as oppression grows against Jewish people, it's also going to grow against Christians in the workplace, in, in politics, in the entertainment world, in the academic world, in, in, the, in the marketplace. It's, it, it's going to grow up um, and it's, it's just built in to Satan's hatred of God. He hates God's people. But all of the sharp arrows and the fires that are aimed at God's people are going to be turned back around and vindication, vengeance is going to fall. Look at verse 5. And this is where I want to focus the next few minutes, 5, 6, and 7, the, the last part of this psalm. Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshach, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. So these are terms that are not familiar to us, but Meshach is a region uh, that most believe was, was in modern-day Turkey. And then Kedar, it refers to um, the descendants of Arab nations in Arabia. Okay, so the idea, if you are an Israelite, an ancient Hebrew, sojourning in in modern-day Turkey or in modern-day Arabia, the idea is you're far from home. The idea is you are in a land where you don't really belong and you don't really feel at home. You're living amongst enemies and your present situation is not your home. So have you ever been displaced? Have you ever been far from home? I'm thinking right now of the first time I went away to college. I love my parents and my brothers. I grew up in a, in a, in a good family environment with generally good church experience from the time I was eight years old forward. Um, we were living on the West Coast in the San Francisco Bay Area when I was in high school, and I went all the way across country to go to college. And I'll never forget, boy, September, I got there early September, or late August, and by first week of October, I was homesick. I was, I was lonely. I was sad. I didn't feel like I belonged in this new place, this new world. I didn't fit. I didn't have many friends, not true friends. I just was lonely. I remember one day just going back after dinner to my dorm room. My roommates were all at work and I just collapsed on at, at my bunk and I got down on my knees and I just cried. In fact, I <laughs> now that I say it, I'm thinking, wow, this I did exactly what I'm reading about in Psalm 120 and verse 1. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord. It was the second semester I got accused of something that I was not guilty of. And, uh, and so I can even identify with the lying lips and deceitful tongue portion of this because I nearly got in some trouble that I did not deserve. Uh, justice was about to fall unjustly and uh, the Lord exonerated me and for which I'm thankful. But uh, th- those are distant memories long time ago. But I can tell you there have been times when I, when I transitioned out here to Connecticut from the West Coast after 22, after really closer to 30 years of living in California um, and then being, you know, replanted in New England with, you know, from the desert to the winter, you know, I mean, oh goodness, I'm still adjusting 12 years later. That feeling though of being displaced, that feeling of not belonging, it's just a terrible feeling. And that's what the psalmist is feeling is, woe is me, I sojourn in Meshach in the tents of Kedar, living in a tent even. Okay, let me just pause and just say, if you are feeling less and less at home. That's a terrible feeling. It's an unsettling feeling. Um, if, if, if inflation and politics and just the, the trouble and the turmoil of the news cycle and, 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 and our cities and our country and our world, if, if this is all distressing you and you're just feeling like, I don't feel like I belong here, what has happened? 
Number one, you're not alone. There are millions of people that feel the way you feel right now. And one of the best things you could do is, is get into a body of believers that you can worship, you can sing, you can pray, you can get around people that all feel the same way, uh, a healthy church. And if you're not able to do that, and I realize many of you that watch the channel are not able to do that, then join us online and stay with us on the journey because that's why I'm doing what I'm doing right now to try to encourage you that you are not alone when you feel displaced, when you feel like a pilgrim far from home. It's a terrible feeling, but it's a good reality. Why? It means that you're loving this life less, this reality less, this world less, which means you're loving heaven and home more. And, you know, as these, as these pilgrims were leaving, you know, these, these faraway lands to go to Jerusalem, or in this case, the psalmist, the, the author of this psalm is probably not able to go to Jerusalem. It's probably too far. Uh, there may not be the ability financially or whatever. It sounds like, you know, that he doesn't get to go. He, she, family, village, whatever. We're, we're stuck here in Meshach. We're stuck here in Kedar. And it would have caused the singers to be thankful for the journey they're making, uh, to be prayerful for those that can't make the journey and that are longing for it. But it would have also given them the sense that, yeah, this journey, this life, this present state is just not home. It's, it's displacing. It's disorienting. We feel out of place. The more you grow in God's grace, the more uncomfortable you're going to be with the world's systems the world's economies, the world's realities, the world's politics, the world's way of thinking, Satan's systems of deception. They're just going to grieve you. They're going to oppress you. They're going to they're going to they're going to zap you at times. They're going to drain your joy and they're going to cause you this deep sense of disorientation and displacement and a deep longing for <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes it sounds like, it seems like we long for something that used to be, but honestly, it's not the good old days we're longing for. It's not how our country used to be. It's not our childhood or something like that that we're longing for. What we're really longing for is the presence of God in our ultimate home. We're longing to finally be at home, to finally arrive at home, to finally see Jesus with our eyes and to be at rest in his real literal presence um, and to have all this nonsense behind us. There was something about this journey. Uh, I'll give you, for instance, if you're leaving Jericho and you're going up through the ravine into Jerusalem, it's a dry and barren and stark starting point. Jericho, it's desert. It's sand, it's rocks, it's cliffs, it's, it's barren wilderness. And the, as you're journeying through, it's this, this canyon and it's dry and barren and rocky and slippery and it would be very hard traveling. And as you're going every step upward, you would, you would become more and more uncomfortable with the journey. Um, and, and the arduous nature of the pilgrimage would probably tempt you to be, to give up along the way, but, but the destination would motivate you and compel you. And that's why I called this video what I called it. It's We're just not long. It won't be long before we see Jesus. And the reason we study that in Scripture and the reason we see that in the signs of the times and we, the reason we're seeing that right now in Revelation and the reason we, we cherish that message even on online and with friends and enjoying the study of Bible prophecy, which shouldn't be our exclusive diet, but hey, we live in the last days and we're seeing all these things become true around us. And so... It, it, there's an anticipation building. It's kind of like rounding the last bend before you bend before you can see the Mount of Olives. And right over the crest of the Mount of Olives was Jerusalem, Temple Mount. And it's interesting because they couldn't see it because the Mount of Olives would have been in the way. But boy, they come around the Mount of or over the crest of the Mount of Olives and there it would have just towered out in front of them, Temple Mount and the city of Jerusalem. And then they would have come down the Mount of Olives and down the Brook Kidron to the Pool of Siloam and Temple Mount would have towered above them. Like, like if you were coming up out of a subway in lower Manhattan and suddenly the Freedom Tower is just, just glistening above you in that glass tower. This would have been a, the sandstone and then the sunset would have been glistening gold. It just would have been amazing and beautiful. It's beautiful today. It would have been 
so much more beautiful in in uh, in ancient times because it would have been new and Temple Mount would have been higher, the valley floor would have been lower, and it just would have been just breathtaking. The city of God before you, and 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 that journey, I, I imagine you'd pick up the pace a little bit as you're coming around those bends, and you might be tired, but climbing that last ridge of the Mount of Olives to see. Jerusalem, your home, you're at the city of God. There's the home of God. There's, We're here for the feast. We're here for the festival. And I just want to tell you, listen, hey, we're almost home. Don't lose heart. Don't, don't let distress eat you up. Don't let your sorrow overwhelm you. Um, let God, let God re-energize you. Yeah, we're sojourning in Meshach and we're temporarily dwelling in the tents of Kedar. This world is not our home. And we're going to feel less and less at home in it. Look at verse 6. My soul has long dwelt with him that hates peace. Isn't that today? Long dwelt with them that hate peace. You realize, we, our world is led by leaders who profit from war. Just remember that, okay? They hate peace. And then verse 7, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. The the sense of this psalm is we live in a world of distress, lies, deception, conflict. We are sojourning. We're pilgrims on a journey. But we have a listening God. We can cry out to him in our distress. He will save us. He will deliver us. He will bring vengeance and justice and praise God. Verse five, we're merely sojourning. This is not a permanent reality. We are almost home and peace is coming and God's going to make it happen. Jesus is going to make it happen. So my friend, we are almost there. It won't be long before we see Jesus. What a good meditation for today. Psalm 120, it's been pretty special. I love Every new psalm is my new favorite psalm. Uh, I love this idea of pilgrimage, pilgrimage. We're on a journey, don't lose hope. We're almost there. We're gonna see Jesus soon. Keep your eyes up, keep crying out, keep trusting him. I'm praying for you, my friends. Have a great day. We'll see you next time.